got to be able to do your dee 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 Susan was here early this morning, and we told her that she had to vote. So y'all can ask Susan after the service. Uh, was the music better during practice or during worship? Because y'all know how sometimes we get distracted. It's <laughs> so Susan, you've got to have your listening ears on because it's your job to let everybody know that y'all should have come for practice. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I think we're ready though, Sam. It's 11 11. So, uh, this is an oldie but a goodie, but it is truly a goodie. So, we hope y'all sing with us this morning. If you're online or if you're here in the house, uh, sing with us. The strength will rise as we wait. Sam, that little, yeah. 
what's that called, Sam, in musical terms? Other than dee 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 That's close enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's why y'all should come to practice. <laughs> well, we are so glad that you are here with us this morning and that you have joined us online. Uh, for those of you Facebookers, I'm going to encourage you to do exactly what I'm doing right now, and I'm saying join us for church. If I can type the word church. And I'm going to share it. So I have just invited all my friends to church. And you will be amazed that I how many people, my friends that I notice, they pop on, sometimes they stay, sometimes they don't, but I've at least invited somebody to church. So if you're a Facebooker, share it, invite somebody to church this morning. And if you are sitting at home, do the same. The more the dominoes fall, the next one we reach somebody else. So we're glad that you're here this morning. Um, a couple of announcements. Um, for those of us uh, online, if you guys want to start getting ready to come to church a little bit later this morning um, after we get done here we're going to travel to the main campus and we're going to have a potluck lunch at 12 30 and we're going to join together in fellowship and just have a nice meal and then at 1 30 we're going to have a congress uh, congregational meeting and um, to talk about um, the comments about possible disaffiliation of the united methodist church so if you guys have questions uh, if you have questions that you want um, us to address at this meeting or next one, I encourage you to bring those. They are going to have, if you have something that you want to say, they're going to give everybody give you a five-minute window to do that so that we give everybody the opportunity to speak today. So I encourage you to come, and if you're at home, get your shower. If you haven't already showered, and, and meet us at church at 1230 or 130 today because it's important that we're all uh, invested in this together. Um, if you are here in the space and you'd like to sign the book, we certainly encourage you to do that. If you're online, give us a shout out. Let us know that you're there. Um, we certainly encourage online participation. So if you want to give Pastor Dan a, an amen through the, through the sermon, he would appreciate that. Um, absolutely. So we're grateful that you're here. There's um, some list of prayer requests that we have, and I always encourage you to do that. There's a Christless walk going on this weekend. Um, We've got some folks from Pleasant View involved in that. Several uh, young adults are there. Several folks from Pleasant View that are serving as volunteers. So continue to keep that um, that walk in your prayers. Um, that's certainly a great weekend for those folks. Um, but it's just good to be here. It is good to be here. So we're going to encourage y'all to, to worship with us this morning. Pastor Dane, you got any other announcements that you know we need to say? Uh, um, they're not going to resurrection this year. Our youth is going to a, a different conference, and they're leaving this week. Um, it's called the, I saw it on here, Stand Up. Um, they're going to Strength to Stand Conference. So, and they're actually leaving this, uh, this Friday. So, um, if you are interested in resurrection, I'm sure that we can get you in contact with, I know, a Mountain View United Methodist that my daughter Jordan's a part of, and uh, several other churches in this area are going to. So if you want to go to resurrection and you have a youth, we can get you in contact with somebody that wants to do that. All right, well, I'm going to encourage you guys to stand and sing with us this morning. suffered as if he did.
As we go into our prayer time this morning, I'm just going to encourage you to just, um, if you have anything that you want specifically lifted up today, if you want Dan to pray with you, he's certainly here to do that. If you want to put something on the cross, you're welcome to do that. If you want to put something on our Facebook feed, knowing that that's a public forum, um, please do that as well. It's it's what we come here for. And um, This next song we're going to sing is called Reckless Love, and you guys have heard me tell this story many times, but... Um, it bears saying again that um, when he goes after the one and leaves the 99, that in today's world and the environment we live in, that that would seem very reckless. You wouldn't just leave one and abandon 99. It would be the exact opposite. You would abandon the one and go after the majority, right? Uh, but that's why God's so powerful, and that's why he is so awesome. 
and it's reckless, but he knows that the 99 is going to be okay, but he's got to go after the one that really, really needs him today. So if you are that one today that really, really needs something, call out to him because he will certainly come and be in the space and right here with you.
no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me would have ever predicted or expected you to come down as a baby how reckless was that a child on this earth to be protected by humans that's God incarnate and yet you came anyway and he went on that cross and you took those nails and you took that abuse for me Lord there's no way that we could ever understand the overwhelming love that you have for us we're so very grateful that you love us anyway so Lord today we just lift your name and praise for that grace and mercy that you give us while it's free for us, it was certainly not free for you. And we'll never be worthy. So Lord, how do we how do we show our love for you? Help us to be kind. Help us to love each other. Help us to be respectful of each other. Help us to stay focused on your mission. Your mission. Let's focus on your mission, Lord keep that in the front of our mind what you've called us to do to share your love in this world that's what we're called to do help that help us never never get out of the forefronts of our mind and don't let anything get in the way of that please Lord please protect us from letting anything get in the way of your mission in our lives so Lord, we just lift up to you things that we know are going on in this world. Friends and family that we know are struggling. That have lost loved ones or having financial difficulties. Or just sad. So Lord, we just lift them up to you today. Lord, we lift this space up to you and we lift the word that you've laid on Dan's heart today. And that we will all take it and be embraced by it. And it will mean something to us today. And it will make a difference in our lives today. Because we all need a little shaking up sometimes. 
So Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being here. And thank you so much for loving us enough to send a Savior that we can have a home with you one day. For it is in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus that we ask all these things. Hey, so um, my name is Dan. I'm one of the pastors here, in case we haven't met or I haven't gotten a chance to greet you online. Um, delighted to see each one of you here. Delighted that you have joined us in worship online. And um, as we continue in that prayer, uh, and I just, I'm really grateful for the music always, but that song especially was so powerful, so thank you for that. Um, it was so prayerful, and it just, it, it reminded me, um, as, as Vicky was praying, you know, about some of the particulars um, of people that we know, and I just want to encourage you to continue to hold Wesley in your prayers. Uh, sometimes he joins us on Facebook, so shout out to Wesley if you're there. Um, but I uh, heard from Susan a little bit of improvement, um, which we're grateful for and we thank God for, but just... Still hold him in your prayers, and I also want to encourage you to pray particularly for Joy uh, Edwards' dad, Jack. Um, he has been in the hospital this week with congestive heart failure. And uh, you might recall he preached a couple weeks ago. So um, Joy has spent a lot of time with him, and um, you know, she's shared with me that, that they're praying and hopeful, and, and yet um, they're tired too in the family from just the vigil of being with him. So. Uh, lift them all up in your prayers, if you would. And I know you have many that you name on your hearts, too. So, um, so happy Epiphany to you. Um, we have moved from the Christmas season into Epiphany that sometimes just kind of flows right in. There's no sharp distinction because Epiphany means manifestation, that the light uh, has come, uh, the light of Christ, we say. And uh, very typically in this season, we have readings from Scripture that are about the baptism of Jesus and uh, some others that we'll typically see. And, and last year, I, I preached on the baptism of Jesus. So this year, I was approaching the text. And, and again, I'm not required to preach selectionary, so I don't always do it. But I just like going to it to see how it speaks. And, and there was the um, Matthew passage on baptism of Jesus. So today is baptism of the Lord Sunday uh, that we always see in January. So happy baptism, uh, Jesus. So um, I thought, well, I'm not going to preach on that text because uh, I kind of did a different baptismal story last year, and maybe we'll just do something fresh. So I was reading some Old Testament text and some other New Testament text, and I just kept coming back to this text, and I just think it really has something to say uh, to us today. So I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 13, or if you want to break out your Bible app. Um, follow along. Uh, it'll also be on the screen. But this is um, the story of the baptism of Jesus that is not just a historical story about Jesus, um, as powerful as it would be for us to just hear that and then walk out. I mean, that would be sufficient, I think. But um, I really think when we uh, enter into the text and we have hearts open to receive, that the Spirit of God speaks to us in new ways and invites us uh, to listen in. Um, so maybe you've heard this text before. Maybe you've heard it a thousand times. But I assure you that if you're listening with um, ears attuned to the Spirit, God is speaking. Beginning in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John, and this is our buddy John the Bap, J. Bap, John the Baptizer, John at the Jordan, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented Jesus, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. 
And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up out of the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is God's word for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. So there are moments in our lives where we want to celebrate something, so we do something special. Um, over the holidays, uh, Samantha and Camille especially put this effort into it, but they fixed some special meals for us, like on Christmas Day and on, on New Year's Day, and we broke out the fine china and, and the glasses that we never use any other time of year, but, you know, special occasions. And we had a special occasion a couple years ago. It was a really super special occasion in our household because Camille and Luke were graduating, Camille from college and Luke from high school. And I should add Zaya too. He was graduating from middle school. So Zaya has finished middle school. Uh, so we celebrate that. Uh, so uh, it was the, that, that spring uh, that all uh, three children were kind of having significant markers in their lives. And we thought, well, we, we need to celebrate this. Um, so, uh, of course, there were caps, uh, of distinction uh, that you wear. I mean, you know these like plate square hats that everybody wears at graduation. Uh, they put those on and they, they marched to um, pomp and circumstance and uh, brilliantly and gracefully went to their seats of honor in their respective graduation moments. Um, but here's the interesting thing. It was May 2020 and it was COVID and nobody was doing anything together in public. And so this, this magnificent festival of graduation took place in our living room. And, and uh, they uh, were like, really, do we have to do this? <laughs> and of course, Samantha and I were like, yes, we have to do this. We have to mark this significant moment. Because you are graduating from college, you're graduating from high school, you're moving up from middle school. This is important. So we had them put on their hats and they went to the top of the steps uh, <laughs> in our house and then they brilliantly marched down the steps in their caps uh, and took their seats of honor on our living room couch. And we listened to the pomp and circumstance move, uh, music. And then um, Camille, who was graduating from Emory and Henry College, she had uh, a video presentation that was put together by professors. Um, and it was a celebration, you know, them giving uh, words of, of praise to the students and recognizing students and things like that. So we watched that, and it was this great moment uh, in our living room, this, this huge mark of uh, something significant. But we wanted it to be a, a, a special day in some ways. I mean, you know, I don't remember every other day in May 2020, but I remember that day because it was a special moment where we did something different, something unique, something to mark the moment and the significance of their achievements. Uh, and in our Matthew 3 text, I think we have something similar going on here, where baptism is used to mark a significant moment in the life of Jesus. And in fact, we, we understand baptism to be one of the significant marks in our own lives when we receive baptism. In the Matthew text, God does something out of the ordinary and does something extraordinary in that baptism moment. You heard the voice of the heavens uh, coming through the skies opening him up. The voice of God speaking audibly. This is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Now, that, that doesn't happen every day. I mean, maybe it does and we just don't hear it. But, I mean, this is something you could hear God audibly saying, Jesus is my beloved son. And he marks Jesus in that moment. But there's also not just an identity that he is claiming for Jesus. But there's also a purpose that he's claiming for Jesus. You know, all the, all the book of Matthew to this point, up to chapter 3, has been stories of Jesus' infancy that we don't get a whole lot of. You know, there are a couple stories in there. Um, and then uh, we have one other story from Luke about when he was 12 and went to the temple and got lost and got in trouble. And um, he, you know, he's like, hey, I was at my dad's house. What's the big deal? <laughs> you know, uh, so we have a couple stories from Jesus' infancy. And then it just kind of fast forwards to this moment where he's, in his 30s, or 30-ish, 31, 32, something like that. And that's this moment um, where John the Baptist has come on the scene. 
And so we're going to look at this text a little bit more and see how this text is significant in marking Jesus' identity and his purpose and how he also uses baptism to mark our identity and our purpose. In baptism, in the mark of baptism, we have what we call vocation. We have this, this ultimate understanding of not only who we are, but what we do, what we're called to do. So we're going to take a look at that. And, and particularly, we'll talk about three ways that God identifies us in baptism, being identified as new creation, being identified as God's beloved, and being identified as God's children. And then going out into the world as the family of God to invite other people into the family of God becomes our vocation. So first, let's take a look at the text. John the baptizer, out in the wilderness with his <laughs> camel-haired suit. <laughs> I just think, oh, that makes me itch. Every time I think of that, it sounds absolutely terrible. Eating locusts, this crazy wild-haired guy out there doing stuff that is actually drawing people. You know, it's not like everybody goes, oh, yeah, John's down by the river doing his crazy stuff. But he's 25 miles east of Jerusalem on the Jordan River. Now, it's contested, you know, where was John actually and where did Jesus actually get baptized. So, but the, the, most scholars think there's a place called Bethany beyond the Jordan. So it's not Bethany where Jesus stays with Mary and Martha. Uh, this is a different Bethany, Bethany beyond the Jordan. So it's right at the Jordan River. And uh, John is down there, and uh, he's, he's preaching, and he's calling people to repentance. Now, what do you repent for? You repent for you've done something not quite right, right? You've done something maybe off. You've done something that has missed the mark. You've done something that you think God hasn't approved of or God tells you he hasn't approved of, right? So you repent of that stuff. So John's doing these baptisms of repentance. He's, he's saying, you brood of vipers, get right with God, repent, and be baptized. So the baptism is happening in the river. Now, we don't know if he's dunking. We don't know if he's uh, pouring and they come up out of the water or he's splashing them with water. We don't know exactly what that looks. The Bible doesn't say. But um, we know that he's using water to call people into right relationship with God through repentance. Now, he's drawing a crowd. I mentioned he's about 25 miles from Jerusalem, but the scriptures say that people from Jerusalem are coming out in all of Judea. And so imagine walking 25 miles, or maybe you get to ride a donkey <laughs> or a camel. I don't know. But if you walked it, you're talking about an eight-and-a-half-hour walk to go see this crazy camel hair-wearing guy down by the river who's going to shout at you and tell you you're a sinner. <laughs> Sounds like a great day, doesn't it? <laughs> Well, people are actually packing out to see John. They're, they're going down, and he's baptizing people, and all of a sudden, in the midst of the crowd, Jesus shows up. And John recognizes Jesus. Keep in mind, they're cousins, so he knows him from that, but he also knows that there's something special about Jesus. And he realizes this is something significant happening in Jesus' life. And he says, whoa, 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 whoa. I should not be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And all the people are like, huh? But John recognized who was in his presence. That the power of God stood in his presence and Jesus should be the one baptizing. And you'll notice in the scripture, Jesus doesn't deny that. He doesn't say, no, 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 you should baptize me because I need your baptism. Instead, he responds, let it be so, so that we might fulfill all righteousness so that we might make full all things right. That we might make full all things holy. This is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. John goes on to um, baptize him, and we hear in that moment, the heavens open, the voice of God thunders, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. And the dove descends, the spirit descends like a dove and lights on him. Now, this primarily marks Jesus in two ways. One is you hear the almighty God's voice speaking to declare Jesus' identity. My beloved son. 
And, and we can say that there are sons of God and daughters of God in all of Israel. But the voice of heaven says, this is my beloved son. Not just another son, but the special son of God. This is my beloved. So identity is proclaimed in that moment of baptism. Like at graduation with our kids, we wanted to mark something special. We did something different. With Jesus, God is saying, this is my son, y'all. <laughs> Listen up, y'all. This is, this is him. This is real. And the second thing is, in the baptism that marks Jesus' vocation. What has Jesus been doing for 30 years? We don't know exactly. We know probably he was doing some hand work, some stone masonry or carpentry with his dad. Probably living in Nazareth for large measure. Was he doing miracles and teaching with authority and all those other things? No. Does it mean he wasn't divine? Yes, he was divine. But God had appointed this time and this season and this moment to mark him and set him forth in his vocation, to send him into the world proclaiming the kingdom has come. Baptism marks identity and vocation for Jesus. And then at the end of Jesus' ministry, after resurrection and before ascension, you have Jesus gathered with the disciples and what we receive in Matthew 28 as the Great Commission. And you probably know these words. We say them so many times. Um, but I want to read to you that scripture. It's Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And I want you to listen to what Jesus is now sending the disciples out in the world to do. Now, they've been doing some of this already for the last three years. They've spent three years of ministry with Jesus. And now he's sending them out into the world with these specific instructions. And he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So you must go and make all the nations into disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And look, I am with you every single day to the very end of the age. Baptism is, the heart, is, is part of the heart of the Great Commission. So it's not just some add-on thing that we do because it's a nice, cute ritual. But it's got a significance that marks us in identity and vocation as Jesus' followers, as God's people. And the early church baptized, and the church has held that as a significant moment in the life of a believer from that day forward when Jesus told us to do it. In the United Methodist Church, as in many of the mainline denominations, we understand that we have two very special markers in the Christian life. And we did the one last week. It was communion. And we repeat that because we need to be nourished at the table of Jesus. We also recognize baptism as, baptism as the second marker. We call these sacraments where, where the mystery of God is doing something powerful through the ordinary. Doing something extraordinary. Beyond the ordinary. To mark special occasions. To declare identity and vocation in our lives. So we have these two sacraments of communion and baptism in our church because they mark us and they send us into the world to do the work of Jesus. I want to talk about three ways that baptism marks our identity. The three ways are, first, uh, we are made a new creation. When you receive baptism, it doesn't magically do this for you. It is a symbol. It is ordinary water that recognizes that God's Spirit has been at work in you to do this, where you are made a new creation. We say being born again, being made anew. What God is doing in baptism is beginning in you the renewal of his creation. It's not going to wait till you get to heaven one day and you get all cleaned up. But even on this earth in the present time, baptism marks the beginning of new creation in you. It doesn't complete it. It doesn't do all the work. We're told in the scriptures that the work of, of becoming that new creation, that image and likeness of God, is an ongoing work. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. 
So we know that this is the ongoing work, but the mark of baptism is the place where that begins, where we recognize that significant moment in your life. So first thing in your identity is this new creation. The second way baptism marks our identity is as God's beloved, just as the voice of heaven spoke from the skies to say, this is my beloved son over Jesus. In the same way, in your baptism, God is speaking that over you. I love the song we were singing where it says, even before I knew you, you were singing over me. And I believe that's true. God's presence is in our lives from the moment before we are born, wooing us and calling us. But our baptism marks that point in our lives where God declares to the world and we declare to the world that we are God's beloved. In the third way, as with Jesus, baptism identifies us, marks us as God's sons and daughters. It is with the mark of baptism that, that we have that special moment, like the shifting of, of, of the, the tassel from one side of the cap to the other, that significant moment where you look back and you say, that's the moment where God declared over me, I'm his beloved daughter. I'm his beloved son, as he did with Jesus. You may understand yourselves in many different ways. If somebody comes up to you at a party and they say, well, tell me about yourself. What do you do? Who are you? You know, my natural instinct would I'd be like, well, I'm a dad, and I'm married to Samantha, and, and she's my better half, and, you know, I'd start saying all these things, and I, I preach some, and I, I practice law a little bit, and, um, you know, I, I teach a little bit, and I do all these things, and I'd start talking about who I am and how I identify myself. And you might identify yourself either through the, the labels that maybe you've put on yourself, the labels that your parents gave you, Labels that your friends and family know you as. Maybe a teacher labeled you in a certain way. I remember my mother telling me that um, she never thought she was a good singer because the teacher told her she wasn't. And she had a beautiful voice. But that, that label always stayed with her. She identified herself as a poor singer because she got that label. And sometimes we do that to ourselves too. We take on those negative labels, right? And we let those labels identify us and what baptism comes along and does and says every label whether good or bad pales in comparison to the label God has given you God has marked you God has identified you as the beloved child so whatever you think about yourself when you look in the mirror when you reflect on who you are however you identify yourself you know Maybe you say, well, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, I'm a patriot, I'm a traitor, I'm a communist, I'm a capitalist. Every other label you can think of, God's voice is breaking in as the heavens open, and baptism marks you as the beloved child. And friends, that is your truest identity. Right? If you know yourself as the beloved child, son or daughter of God. Do any of the other labels really matter? They don't. So when you're struggling with your identity where you're worried about who you are and all these other things, I want you to think of the story of the baptism of Jesus. And I want you to think about the story of your baptism. Whether you remember it or not, we talk about remembering our baptism, that's putting it back together in our heads and our hearts, even if we were baptized as infants. Not necessarily remembering the particular moment. But what that invites you to do is remember that the most important thing that anybody can say about you, that God has said about you, that in union with Christ, you are his beloved child. You're marked with identity in baptism. Now, our, our identity as children of God means that then we become the family of God. I mean, think about this. I don't know if you woke up this morning and you said, hey, I'm going to go to worship today um, and I'm going to celebrate that I'm part of a family 
of uh, two billion people. <laughs> there are two billion Christians in the world. I'm saying two and a half now, somewhere in there. Give or take a few hundred thousand, a few million, whatever. <laughs> two billion brothers and sisters that you have in the world. And what baptism does is begin to bring a unity in this new creation. I love that thought. And and it's sometimes hard for me to get my head around because I know in my own life I am closer to the people who are my blood family, right? I mean, I don't see my brother or my sister every day. I don't talk to them every day. But there's still that bloodline, you know, that connection to them, that family thing we got going on where I can just pick up where I left off. You know, I go a couple weeks and then call my brother up or text him or message him. And we don't have to apologize for not talking for the last three weeks. We just have that connection of being true family. And what baptism marks in you is that you enter into this deeper unity. There's a saying that, that blood is thicker than water, right? Meaning that, that the, the blood that you have, the kinship that you have with your actual family is, is thicker than anything else, right? And I want to just offer a tweak on that. And I want to say to you that blood and water are thicker than any other things that you're ever going to find in the universe. Because your kinship, your childship, your belovedness in God puts you in the family of God that is formed by the blood of Jesus on this cross. Marked for you in the waters of your baptism. Blood and water. Marking you. Calling you to this deeper unity. That doesn't mean you're necessarily going to agree with me or anybody else in this room or any of the other two billion Christians in the world on every single thing. Unity does not mean uniformity. But it still calls us to a kinder relationship with one another that's lived out in love. I saw this poster when I was in seminary. One of my professors... I had it on his door. And it said, what if all the Christians in Ireland, and this is a reference to the time of the Troubles where the Protestants and the Catholics were physically killing each other over a supposed religious argument. There was other things to it, a lot of politics that had nothing to do with religion, but they still went to their corners as Catholics and Protestants. But the poster said, what if all the Christians in Ireland actually just loved each other? And I think about that for the world and what that means as being family, God's family, that is so far beyond the walls of this room or even the the main campus that we're going to later today at Pleasant View. The family of God, two billion What if we all just started at a place of loving each other across languages and borders and cultural divides? I mean, would that not make for a more beautiful world? Would that not be signs of the kingdom come, the new creation? Unity, even though we don't have uniformity. Which gets us to that final point about baptism marking us, not just in the ways of identity as new creation, as God's beloved child, but baptism marks you with purpose. And I don't know if a lot of Christians, particularly in America, understand this or live this. Maybe they know it in their heads. Being brought into God's family as a gift of his grace, being declared beloved, I think our tendency sometimes in the American church is just to say, woo, I'm in. My ticket's punched, I'm going to heaven, woo. And 
the scriptures are telling you there's an expectation that comes with that baptism. That just as Jesus was sent into his public ministry, you too are sent into your public ministry in his name by the power of his spirit, marked at your baptism. That's what baptism does. Just as for my kids, it starts a new chapter in their lives when they celebrate their graduation, when they move to high school or they move to college or they finish college and move into what's next. Your baptism marked the place at which God said, now go. Go and tell others that they too can be my beloved. That they too can join in this family of God. So you are marked with the truest identity you will ever know that's going to sustain you in, in days that are joyful, but also those dark days when you've got so, so much self-doubt going on. But it's not just about you. The mistake we make in the American church is we we want to personalize our religion, which is not a bad thing. It is very personal about you. Christ died for you. But we also hear the words that we should privatize that. And personalize and privatize are two different ideas. You will find personalized in the Bible. You will not find privatize your faith in the Bible. And yet we have a tendency to do that. Well, it's my faith. It's my truth. You do what you want. You know, this is all about me. No. Your baptism is baptism has marked you as one who is sent into the world then to go and tell others about the love of God known in Jesus so we come to this place today on the baptism of our Lord Sunday thanking God for his word that speaks about how God has declared for us very clearly who Jesus is and his purpose in our lives. And we hear his spirit saying to us, you too are my beloved and you too are called to go and be light in a dark world. And so I mentioned our sacraments um, of communion and baptism uh, we do this thing in the Methodist Church recognizing that you know we we baptize infants um, and we just so you know in the Methodist Church too we baptize we baptize uh, by sprinkling by pouring and by immersion we'll dunk you too but we baptize once because we believe that God's grace comes so strong and God is the actor of grace in these things And because of that, we also have these moments where we invite you to remember your baptism. And that's what we're going to do in these next moments. That if you've been baptized, let me say this first of all. If you've never been baptized, uh, but you feel this connection to God, that you feel that you believe Christ is your Savior, you believe Christ is the true Son of God, the beloved Son, uh, talk to me and, and let's get you baptized. Uh, if for no other reason, because Jesus said do it, you don't have to figure it out and know all the mystery of baptism. I truly believe that God is at work in the water in ways we don't understand. I don't think it's magical. I don't think it, it's um, anything, uh, you know, incantation-oriented that we have to do some prayers and turn the water into something special. God used an ordinary water here as a symbol something much greater than our words or symbols can express and that's what symbols do they express something greater than what's in front of you so we have water in front of us and yet the symbol is of God at work his grace at work in you to declare you as his beloved so we think in the Methodist church at least that it's good for us to remember that to Again, you may have been baptized as an infant. Or maybe you remember. I, I remember I was, um, I was 10 or 11. The First Baptist Church in Kannapolis, North Carolina. The big old Dr. Charles Coffey stood up there. and I was as nervous as I could be, but I just felt that, that spirit calling me. And I went and made my profession of faith, and then I was baptized by him. 
So I can remember pieces of it, but honestly, I can't remember going under the water. I can't remember coming up. But we want to invite you into a time where you remember, where I get to remember, and by that to remember, to put back together in my head and my heart what God was doing in those moments for me when I was a kid what God has continued to do for me along the journey to invite me into his grace. So if you're inclined, if you've received baptism before, if you haven't, talk to me. If you've received baptism before, we call this a baptismal remembrance where you're just invited to come up, touch the waters, and maybe just putting a finger in it or a couple fingers in it, or if you want to take it and splash it on your face, I'll ask you not to splash each other. (laughs) It's just a time for you to remember and put back in your hearts and minds God's grace and his declaration of your truest identity. You're his beloved. And also, remembering his expectation and his call and his vocation for you to go and tell others. And then we do that not in our own strength, but by the strength of his spirit. I want to invite you to pray with me. God, we are yours. Before we knew you, you were singing over us. We come before you this day, recognizing your goodness in our lives, that you have been so, so good in so many ways to us. And you have given us the gift of your son, Jesus, through the gift of water in Mary's womb. And then in his baptism, marked him as your beloved, sending him into the ministry of saving us by your grace. So God, we pray that you would come in this ordinary water and do some extraordinary things in our hearts and minds as we open ourselves to the work of your spirit to declare over us are your beloved and then to empower us to go from this place as your beloved to invite others into your family come Jesus by the power of your spirit in his name we pray amen so there's no particular order on how to do this you're just welcome to come up and touch the waters you can make the sign of the cross on your head or just rub your hands in it or splash your face in it. But we invite you to come and remember.
guys some words. This song we're going to sing, it's easy to get just, it's a good song, but it also says, um, and it's very appropriate for today. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. Because I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. That's our identity. Won't you stand and sing that with us today? Claim it and own it as your own. saying to God, I am who you say I am. And he has declared through split in the heavens that you are his beloved. That's who you are. So go and share that good news that in spite of every other label that somebody wants to put on you, you're God's beloved. Share that with somebody else so they can know that truth too. Invite them into the family. Invite them into his love. 
I want you to go out of here celebrating and figuring out when your baptismal date is. I had to get help from my parents to learn the actual date. But I've marked on my calendar the baptismal dates of my children. And I celebrate those. And I probably don't do it well enough. I should probably take them out for cake, right? Say it's nodding yes. <laughs> But if that's the day you are truly born into who you are, is there any other greater date in your life? <laughs> so eat some cake on the date of your baptism. And if you can't figure it out, make up a day. We don't know Jesus' actual day. It wasn't January 8th. But it's the day we remember and put back together in our hearts and minds the grace of God. So go in peace to love all that you meet. And I want to just say this real quick about this afternoon. If you go, there's a possibility, a possibility for words that hurt. The issue we're talking about in our church is a divisive one. But my hope for all of us, is that whatever words we hear, whoever speaks them, you will look upon that person as a beloved child of God. And remember that first and foremost. So go in peace to love this afternoon and to love throughout the week. In the name of Father, Son, and Spirit.